Let's uh, take our Bibles and turn to Philemon. So if you get to Hebrews, you're too far. It's Philemon, Hebrews, James, Philemon. And there's only one chapter, so we'll um, just read these verses together. By the way, one thing I didn't mention about the AGM is I really need to get have that booklet done by another 10 days or so. So if you are in charge of a ministry, like if you're um, a small group leader or... Um, finance or whatever it might be, please get your reports to me so I can put all that together uh, hopefully next weekend or something and then you can have more booklets ahead of time um, as well. So AGM coming up, it's really come up kind of quickly so um, we need to get those reports in and then we'll hand them out to you for that Sunday on the, on the 3rd. All right, Philemon, did you find it? Or if you were in Zambia, it was Philemon, I think. Philemon. Philemon. All right, so this morning I thought I'd preach through the entire book of Philemon. It's, it's very short, just 25 verses, so just a one-off message. And it's probably one of the more neglected books of the New Testament, so maybe you've not thought about it before. I hope to change your mind about it today. Um, but a bit of background before we read it together. Uh, Paul writes this letter from prison, just as he was in prison in 2 Timothy recently. We looked at that. So he's, he's in prison here. Um, while he's been in prison, he's come into contact with a man named Onesimus. And Onesimus is a slave on the run. He's run away from his master Philemon uh, because he's committed some wrong. We don't know what that was. Um, but Onesimus has wronged Philemon in some way. And so he's run away to Rome probably thinking that nobody would find him. But God, in his good providence, uh, you know, Onesimus runs into the Apostle Paul. And through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, uh, Onesimus becomes a Christian. So now, now Paul is sending Onesimus back uh, to Philemon. And uh, you know, he's, he's become a Christian. He's, he's a good man. He's useful now. Now Paul is sending him back. And in many ways, I think Paul would have liked to have had Onesimus stay with him. We'll talk about that later, um, because now he's so useful. Um, but he's saying, Philemon, please take him back. He's, he's not only uh, useful to you, but he's your brother in Christ. And uh, we'll talk about that. So keep all that mind, in mind, and we'll read from verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your own me, even your own self. 
Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So, we know that we ought to forgive each other when someone wrongs us. We know that we ought to forgive each other. Um, we know that we ought to be ready to forgive other people. That's the right thing to do. That's the Christian thing to do. That's what Jesus commands us to do. But it's not always easy, is it? It's not easy all the time to forgive someone, especially if they've hurt you badly, if they've committed some serious wrong against you. It's not easy to forgive that person, even if they are truly repentant. And I imagine, in fact, I know, because I know some of your stories, that you've been, in the past, very badly hurt by other people. I imagine that some of you have been sinned against in a very serious way, maybe even by fellow Christians, fellow believers, and you find it very hard, if not impossible, to forgive the one who sinned against you. That's just the reality of it. And Philemon, as we study this short little letter, uh, Philemon is someone who has been wronged, someone who's been sinned against by Onesimus. And as I said just a minute ago, uh, we're not told exactly what the wrong is. Um, Onesim Onesimus has, has done something, but now whatever it is, Paul is writing to Philemon, wanting him to forgive Onesimus and take him back. And Onesimus, who's run away from his master, ended up coming in contact with Paul, becoming a Christian. And now Paul writes to Philemon and encourages him to take, to forgive, to receive back uh, this fugitive slave. And notice this, he wants him to receive Onesimus back no longer as a slave, verse 16, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. In other words, he wants Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to really forgive him, to genuinely forgive him from the heart, and to be reconciled to him and to treat him as a brother in Christ, no longer as a slave, but as someone who is a fellow believer. Now, I'm not going to talk about Roman time slavery today. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, I want to just push that aside right now and just think about the forgiveness aspect today in, in, this, in this message. And I want you to see, as we go through this letter, how Paul tries to persuade Philemon, how he, what his method is to persuade Philemon to, to receive back Onesimus. Paul could have commanded Philemon, you know, he's an apostle, he's a, he's a godly leader. He could have commanded Philemon, instead he appeals to him, he seeks to persuade him to forgive Onesimus. So verse 8, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ. So Paul had the apostolic authority to say to Philemon, you must forgive Onesimus. But instead of giving a command, he seeks to persuade Philemon. He appeals to him. Why? I, I think the reason is he wants to appeal to him on the basis of his Christian faith. He wants him to put into practice his Christian faith. He wants Philemon to work out the gospel in his life. He wants Philemon to show goodness and grace and Christ-likeness, not because he has to, but because he wants to. He doesn't want Philemon to receive an estimate back by compulsion, verse 14, but of his own free will. I want you to do this because you want to. We raise our kids and we say, look, I don't want you just to obey mommy and daddy because you have to. We want you to get to the point where your attitude, your heart is right. You say, I want to do this because I want to serve, or whatever the case is. So as a result, rather than issuing some kind of apostolic command, it, instead of pulling rank on him, Paul seeks to persuade Philemon. And I want you to see how he does it. He does it in a couple of different ways. 
Um, and I'll go through those ways this morning. I, I've left you space in your bulletin to take notes here and to write these down. Um, so hopefully we can learn in our own lives how we can be persuaded to forgive each other and to be reconciled with each other. So first, <clears throat> Paul tells Philemon that he thanks God for him. He thanks God for him. Look at verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Do you pray like that? You think of other brothers and sisters in Christ and other workers and pastors and fellow Christians. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Paul is deeply and genuinely thankful for Philemon. Why? Why is he th so thankful to him, uh, to, to God for him? Well, he says it's because of Philemon's love. And because Philemon himself is a man of love. He's a Christian man. He's a man of grace and goodness. And Paul says in verse 7, for I have derived, I have received much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, Philemon, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Do you see what Paul's saying there? He's saying, I've been greatly blessed by you, Philemon. You're a beloved brother. You're a beloved fellow worker in Christ. You're a man of love. You've refreshed my heart. You've refreshed the hearts of the church that meets in your house. Uh, you've, you've been a man of love, you're godly, now because of that, refresh my heart again and forgive Onesimus. He's saying, Philemon, you are a man who's shown grace, the grace of God towards others. You're a man who's been changed by grace. Now, as a result, please refresh my heart. Reminds me, just off the, off the top here, Third John, where John says, I, I, I have no other joy, no greater joy than to see you walking in the Lord. I guess as a pastor, as, a, as an apostle here, Paul, nothing brings him greater refreshment, greater joy than to see people practicing their Christianity. Nothing brings us greater frustration than to say the same things over and over again and see no change. But, it, but it's great joy to see, hey, they're practicing their Christian faith. Refresh my heart. How, how does he do that? By, by receiving Onesimus back. Will you not refresh my heart? Then notice how Paul describes himself in verse 9. He says, I could command you to do what's required, verse 9, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. How does he describe himself? I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner for Christ Jesus. How does he describe himself? He says, I'm an old man. Probably, I reckon he's around 60 at the time. If you look at the letters and the, the, the timing and so on, he's about 60. No doubt he would have looked a lot older because of all the shipwrecks and the stonings and the beatings and the hard life that he'd had. He looks very old, I'm sure. But why does he mention, almost in passing, that I'm an old man in prison? I think he wants to draw out Philemon's pity and his sympathy and compassion. He wants, as it were, to tug on Philemon's heartstrings, right? Philemon, how can you say no to me for this? Because I'm an old man in prison, you know? How can you say no to me? It, it's hard saying no to an older person. <laughs> I have a few here, and I'm getting a bit older, and people have said to me, well, I have to do what you ask, Max, because you're older, and you're the, you're, you're the pastor, and uh, I don't want you to do because of pity or because of my age, but I think we've lost a bit of that, though, in our culture, in our modern times. On the occasion that I find myself sitting on the train, it, it frustrates me to no end to see an older person standing there holding the pole and some young guys just sitting in the chairs. Get up and give your chair up for these older men or older women. I, I think that's why Paul mentions his age. He says, well, give deference to me. Um, show sympathy, show respect to me because I'm older and I'm in prison. I'm suffering for the sake of the gospel. Will you not refresh my heart by receiving back Onesimus? And then look at how he describes Onesimus, the slave, the runaway slave. Paul calls Onesimus, verse 10, my child. I love that. He says, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Those of you who are parents or those of you who are uncles or aunts or, or whatever, you'll understand this. There's nothing you wouldn't do for your children or for your relatives or for your nieces or nephews. There's a strong bond there, right? 
Paul was Onesimus, not, not his physical father, obviously, but his spiritual father. He led him to Christ. Onesimus is running away. He runs into Paul, and Paul probably taught him the gospel. He, he probably shared Christ with him, his own testimony. And through the Holy Spirit, Onesimus comes to a living, saving faith in Jesus. And Paul is instrumental in that, isn't he? So he has this deep fatherly affection. If you've led somebody to Christ, you have that deep affection for them as their spiritual parent. Uh, Onesimus is his spiritual son. He says in verse 12, he is my very heart. What an incredibly strong word there. Uh, this burning intensity of love for Onesimus. So Paul's very persuasive here. He says, won't you forgive and welcome him back? He's my son, my spiritual son. He's so very dear and precious to me. Verse 17, receive him back. This is good. As you would receive me, Paul says. If you would receive me into your home and forgive me, well, you need to do that for Onesimus, my spiritual son. There are times when you welcome people into your home or you, you show hospitality to somebody, you might not even know them very well, but you might know their parents. So I know that uh, some of my kids were planning to go to uh, Kentucky and America a couple of years ago before COVID hit. And, you know, they don't know our friends in Kentucky too well. But our friends in Kentucky would have welcomed them with open arms. You know, they know Hannah and they know me. And they'd say, oh, you know, we know your parents. Welcome into our home. And they would treat them as they would treat us. You understand that kind of a concept. So that's what Paul's saying here. Onesimus is my child. I love him. I'm his father in the faith. Philemon, won't you therefore receive him as you would receive me? And Paul seeks to persuade him in that way. So what, what do we got here? What's his method? He, he seeks to persuade Philemon by telling him that he thanks God for him, by reminding him of his old age and his imprisonment, by calling Onesimus his, his very own child. Paul also seeks to persuade Philemon to forgive Onesimus by interpreting, by seeing everything that's happened in this, in this event in the light of God's providence. I want you to see this in verses 15 and 16. He says, For this perhaps, and I like that word perhaps, because I think he's saying this is the real reason. <laughs> but the way he says it is, This perhaps was why he, Onesimus, was parted from you for a while. What was the party? Well, he ran away. He did something bad, something naughty. He ran away, did something. But maybe this was the reason for that wicked thing, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh, you know, physically, and in the Lord, spiritually. Do you see what Paul is saying to Philemon? He's saying, what has happened is regrettable. He's not brushing it under the carpet. He's saying, you know, this was not good. Onesimus certainly did what was wrong to you, Philemon. I'm not excusing that, but he's saying, look at the bigger picture here. Look at the great big picture of God's control over all things, his sovereignty. We are talking this morning about God's knowledge. He knows all things, and he providentially works all things out for his glory and for our good. So Paul sees what happened as, as a divinely orchestrated, governed opportunity for Philemon to show God's grace and forgiveness to Onesimus. He sees God's hand directing the whole situation for good, for Onesimus's good, and for Philemon's good, and for Paul's good, and for God's glory. Beforehand, Onesimus was useless. Do you know what Onesimus means? You might have it in your footnote. Useful. Onesimus was a very common um, slave name. It meant profitable or useful. So when you look at verses 10 and 11, it's a bit of a play on words here. Uh, Onesimus, useful. Formerly, verse 11, he was useless to you. He was a pain. Even though his name is Onesimus, he did something that was wrong, something bad. Uh, maybe he'd get on the nerves of other people. I don't know. In the household, um, maybe he was rebellious. I, I don't know. Maybe he stole something or whatever happened. And he runs away. 
And what happens? He happened, quotation marks, he happened to come into contact with Paul in Rome, in the big city. I think Onesimus is thinking, where can I hide? I'll, I'll hide in the big city of Rome. It's so large, nobody will ever notice me. Nobody will ever find me. And he run, what, what happens? He runs into Paul. And Paul's in prison of all places, in prison. And as a result, he becomes a Christian. As a result, he's no longer useless. This tells me that Christians ought to be good workers. They ought not to be useless. You should not be a Christian who's lazy. You ought to be a Christian who is productive, who's serving, who's fruitful. And Onesimus is no longer rebellious. He is now a useful servant of the Lord, someone who's been transformed by the power of the gospel. That's one of the themes that runs through this letter, how Onesimus has been transformed, how he's been changed by the gospel. If you're a Christian, you're no longer the employee that you used to be. You say, what happened? Well, I met Jesus. And now I'm not working for, for you as I am working for a boss, but I'm, I'm working for the Lord. I'm giving him the glory. You ought to be a different person, right? And Paul is saying to Philemon, don't you see the good hand of God in this? Look at the bigger picture. See how God's brought so much good out of this negative, evil thing. Isn't he the most wonderful, glorious God, providential governing all things for our good and for his glory. Onesimus, although his name means useful, he was kind of useless. Ah, but what changed? He became a Christian. And because of that, God transformed him to be a useful servant of the Lord. So Paul's saying, do you see all the good that's come out of this all because of God's providence? I see a little thread weaving through today's service. I didn't really plan it, but that's the way it is. A negative thing happens. There's a story that Jason and Jess told us a few months ago. A negative thing happened where they work. And I remember their letter, they said something like, who knows, but God is using this to, to allow us to share the gospel with our workers and our friends and so on. You never know what God's doing. This, this bad thing happens. Look what God can do through all that. He can turn it all for his, his good, for our good and for his glory. So now, Philemon, it's, it's on you. You have this God-ordained opportunity to forgive Onesimus and to take him back as a brother. Don't stand in the way of God's providence. So here, here's the persuasive argument. Paul's saying, you wouldn't want to work against the God who providentially weaves all things together for his glory. I've used this before, but you ever see one of those great, big, huge wall hangings, those tapestries? like in a medieval castle. We stayed in a castle a few years ago. They, they cover the whole wall. Maybe it's a scene of some battle or some landscape or something. If you get the chance, take a look on the other side of that tapestry. And if that's all you can see was the opposite side, you would see a mess of threads going this way and that, globs of this color, blobs of that color, uh, things attached where you think, why is this attached? It's all just... It looks chaotic and random. But when you walk around the other side, then you see what that woven picture is doing. Then you see the scene. And it's beautiful, and it's perfect, and it makes sense. So often, all we see is the other side of the tapestry. And not just the other side. We only see this little bit. We, we, we see this little black bit. And then we turn around and go around the other side. One day we'll get to do that in heaven, I suppose. We'll go around the other side and we'll see how that dark bit was part of this great picture. And it sets off this beautiful, glorious, bright scene because you don't have the brightness without the darkness. And it's, it's beautiful. That's God's providence. And Paul is saying to Philemon, you have this God-given opportunity to, to see God's providence and work in, in, in God's providence in that way. So Paul wasn't asking Philemon to do something easy. Um, forgiveness is often quite hard, but see it in this way. Try to see it as a God-given opportunity to show Christian grace. God rules over your life. He does. And your circumstances, according to your, you know, according to his providence, according to what you do, the choices that you make, and so on. So try to see all that. Maybe even especially the, the, the hard bits. 
as God-given opportunities to show and extend grace to others. The final thing that Paul does, uh, or the final thing that I'm going to mention this morning, is that he reminds Philemon that Philemon too is a debtor to God's grace and to Paul's uh, account as well. In verse 18, if he has wronged you at all, Onesimus, if he's, if he's wronged you, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I had to think about this. Charge that to my account. Paul's in prison. I know he hopes to be out of prison, but he, I don't think he really would have had much of an account. I don't think he's just talking about money here, right? And it makes sense in verse 19. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Paul is saying... I'm willing to pay Onesimus' debt. I'm, I'm willing to pay whatever it takes. I'll bear the cost. Charge that to my account. What's on Paul's account? Or what, what's on, I guess, Philemon's ledger from Paul? It, I think it's the fact that Paul led him to Christ. And, and Paul has served Philemon. Paul has done good things for Philemon. So his ledger with Philemon, Paul's way up in the, in the positive there. He's got a lot in the bank. And so Paul is saying to Philemon, don't forget that you owe me. Even your own life, you, you owe me. Uh, all the things I've done to you, ministering the gospel to you, preaching, um, so that you now have eternal life, you know, won't you do this very small thing for me and, and, and take Onesimus back and forgive him and welcome him as a brother. Verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Well, what's that? Even more than I say. Maybe Paul is thinking, you won't just receive Onesimus back and forgive him, but maybe you'll cancel the debt that he owes you as a slave. And, and not just that, but maybe, maybe you'll send him back to me, back to Paul, um, given that he'd become this great, useful servant. So look, Philemon, you've been forgiven much, not just by Paul, of course, but by God, of course. You've been forgiven so much. Don't you want to forgive much as well? Now, do you see the point? Do you see the point developing here for us? Isn't this the same case with you? Surely this is the same case. We've been forgiven so much. You know that parable. The, the servant who'd been forgiven of this great debt and then couldn't forgive, didn't want to forgive his fellow servant. We've been forgiven so much Surely we can forgive each other. This is how the gospel works out in our lives. The gospel is not just for 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever. When you were saved, this is how it works out in your life. So Paul seeks to reconcile Philemon to Onesimus, not by pulling rank, not by commanding him, but he does it graciously and gently. He says, Philemon, I'm so thankful to God for you. Refresh my heart. He says, I'm an old man. I'm in prison. Take pity. Please do what I'm asking. Oh, Onesimus, he's my child. I'm his spiritual father. Receive him back as you'd receive me. He says, look at God's good providence. Don't work against God's providence. Work with it. And now show grace to him. You who also are a great debtor to grace. Great pastoral wisdom here. It really is. Uh, sometimes I suppose there's a, a place for issuing a command for pounding the pulpit and saying, you must do this, I would rather say, gently, why don't you follow Christ in this and see what you need to do. And I'll appeal to your heart because you need to do this. So in hearing Paul's words to Philemon, here's the point, Jesus Christ is speaking to us. Do you get that? What Paul is saying to Philemon, it's really Christ speaking to us. Paul is, if you like, he's like a mouthpiece of Jesus to you this morning. And Jesus does command us to forgive. He does say things like, if you can't forgive others, you can't be forgiven by me. There are commands like that. Or Paul, where he says, forgive each other as God in Christ has forgiven you. There are commands. But there's also a tenderness and a sweetness and a gentleness about Jesus, and he persuades you to forgive others. He, as it were, says to you, I know that it's hard. It's, it's incredibly hard to, to love and to forgive that person who's wronged you. Uh, and yet, uh, this is what you need to do because I've changed your heart. Have I not forgiven you of so much? 
Were not all of your sins charged to my account? Did I not pay your debt at full with my blood? Have I not reconciled you to my Father? Given this, show grace to others. Receive them as you would receive me, as I have received you into my life. You see, we do all things for Christ's sake, everything we do for Christ's sake. This is how we apply the gospel to broken relationships. The gospel is for right now to be applied to you. We do all for him, all for the sake of Christ. Uh, that's the way we are to view our relationships with others. And so Jesus is so gently, so tenderly, so graciously persuading us to forgive each other. And we need to hear this word. We do. If you spend any length of time in church, you are going to get hurt. You will. Uh, People will wrong you. You will wrong other people, I guarantee it. People will offend you. People will perhaps sin very seriously against you. And that's true of us here at ECG as it's true of any church. People will let you down. They will say things that discourage you. They will forget things. Even if they didn't intend to hurt you, they will hurt you. This will happen. But the, the, the real question is, when someone does sin against you, how will you respond how will you react? Will you simply avoid that person? Will you nurse your grievance? Will you seek revenge? Will you keep a list? Or will you do the Christ-like thing and seek to, for to forgive? This morning, my friends, listen to the sweet persuasion of Jesus here in Philemon. Will you receive others as you would receive him? Will you show grace for Jesus' sake? I pray that we are Always going to be that kind of a church, gracious to each other, a church filled with the sweet, refreshing grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, uh, we pray that we would, we would know much more of how much you have forgiven us, how you have been so very merciful and gracious to us in Christ, how all of our sins have been charged to your account, and we pray that we would listen to you, your persuasion, your appeal, as it were, to be kind and gracious and loving and forgiving to others. And we pray that we would do all this for Jesus' sake and in his name.